All right, part four, a video review of inverse functions. So let's talk first about what has to be true for the inverse to be a function. So the inverse of a function is created by exchanging the x-coordinates, which would be the domain, and the y-coordinates, which would be the range, of the points that comprise the function. This is equivalent to reflecting the graph of a function over the line y equals x, so there's a mirroring happening, and it says the resulting points or the resulting reflection may or may not be a function itself. So every function has an inverse. Not all functions have an inverse that's also a function. Okay, kind of keep those things together in your head. You can find an inverse for anything. It just might not end up being a function. So in this case, the red is our original function and the blue is our inverse function and they have reflected over the y, line y equals x. Both of these are functions because they pass the vertical line test. In this case, we have a function, looks like this was a square root graph, okay? We reflect it over the line y equals x, and we get this new inverse, which is also a function because it passes the vertical line test. So in order for a relation originally to be a function, we have to pass the horizontal, or sorry, woo, oh no, I'm jumping ahead. We have to pass the vertical line test, which means that there is one input maps to one unique output. Okay, one in, one out. That's our function definition for mathematics. But for a function to have an inverse that is also a function, you have to pass the horizontal line test as well. So it's not just that you had one in, one out, it's that you had one out only was from one in, okay? Now, the way that we describe that is something called one-to-one. -one. So something that is one-to-one -one would be f of x equals x to the third. For any x value that you pick, you get a unique y value, okay? Passes the horizontal line test. If I took a horizontal line and I dragged it, Two, 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 only ever intersects once. This would be different than, let's say, a cubic function. Hmm. I don't actually have a function per se, but we'll call a function that is cubic but has multiple turns. Because now if I take this horizontal line test right here, if I were to choose the output, I have multiple inputs that created that output. So we saw this actually originally when you first started learning about inverse trigonometric functions and why we create restricted domains for those inverse trig functions. So we don't have any repeat values. The easiest one to think and remember that won't pass a horizontal line test is x to the second, okay? Because if I pick an output here, it's intersecting twice because I could have had the negative version or the positive version that I've plugged in and squared, thus resulting in multiple inputs creating the same output. All right, it's a lot to keep track of. Um, but also you can think about it because an even root, when you take it, you get plus or minus for your answer when you're solving. So you could have had the positive or the negative input. So as a side note, we know that any function that is strictly increasing, <clears throat> the natural log function, or strictly decreasing, will be one to one. Therefore, any function that is strictly increasing or decreasing, also like the exponential function, will have an inverse, duh, everything has an inverse, but that inverse will also be a function. There's a fancy word, being strictly increasing or strictly decreasing means that you are monotonic monotonic. So that means that the derivative is always positive or the derivative is always negative. That means the function was monotonic. What that also means is you never had any critical numbers. You never had the potential. I should take that back. I misspoke. 
you never have any critical numbers that turn into maximums or minimums. What you do have is positive number line the whole time for a derivative test or a negative number line the whole time for a derivative test. So the definition of an inverse function. So our definition is if a function g is the inverse of f, then when you compose f of g together, okay, for each x in the domain of g, so f of g of x is going to be equal to x, and g of f of x is equal to x. So basically what happens is g and f cancel each other out. Something to note to remember just notation-wise, g circle f is the same thing as g of f of x, which means you start plugging your x, run it through function g, take that new number, run it through function, or sorry, run it through function f, take that new number, run it through function g. So notation for an inverse, if something comes back as an inverse function, we write it as f inverse or g inverse or h inverse, something with that little negative one. Be really careful because sometimes that negative one looks like the prime sign for derivatives. So make sure you're careful between the two. All right, so inverses cancel out because an inverse of f will undo what is done by f. It's like tying your shoe and then untying your shoe. Or it's like giving directions going to school and then giving directions from school back to your home. Okay, so you want to go forward and then you want to undo things at a time. So steps to find an inverse. Step one is just replace f of x with y. And that is nothing other than a notation switch around to keep us in simpler variables, okay? Step two, uh, switch all y and x values. So this is where the domain and the range are going to physically be switched. This is where you are actually creating the inverse. You're mirroring over that line y equals x. Step three is to solve for y. That's a y. And step four is to go back to function notation. All right, so let's go ahead and try these out. Given f of x is 3x minus 2, find the inverse function. Well, step one is to switch out f of x for y. Step two is to switch all x's and y's. Right there, I just created the inverse by changing out my domain and my range. Step three is to solve for y. One third x plus two thirds is equal to y. You also could write x plus two all divided by three. That's totally fine. Uh, last step then is to go back to function notation. Well, this comes out as a linear. This is definitely going to be an inverse function. Okay, or you could have again written x plus two over three. So let's think about this from a directions standpoint. The original function says take an x value multiply it by three, lower it by two. The new one says take an x value, increase it by two, divide it by three. We are undoing the operations that were listed in the original. And remember you work backwards in the same way if you were giving directions. If you said turn left out of the driveway, okay, when you come home, you gotta think about how would you undo that. When you reverse your directions, you go from where you ended back to where you started. All right, next one, a little bit trickier with the algebra, but the concept is still the same. So we're gonna replace our H with Y. We're gonna switch all of our X's and Y's. This is where I am officially creating the inverse by switching out the domain and the range. Now we're gonna solve for Y. So I'm gonna have two, False, try that again. Uh, when I cross multiply, I'm just gonna leave it as x times two y minus five equals y plus four. Now I'll show the distribute step. So two x y minus five x equals y plus four. I'm gonna move everything that has a y with it to one side because that's what I'm, 
my gosh. That's what I'm trying to solve for. So 2xy minus y equals 5x plus 4. Factor out that y value. So final answer, my inverse function is going to be equal to 5x plus 4 over 2x minus 1. Now, this one's a little bit harder to think about the undoing of directions, but something that is pretty cool is from the original function, we would have had a vertical asymptote at x equals 5 halves because that's going to be where we have a denominator issue. We would have had a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1 half because of our leading coefficients and even heaviness. When I go through to check my final answer, watch what happens. I now have a vertical asymptote at x equals 1 half and a horizontal asymptote at y equals 5 halves because my x's and y's have switched, which means my asymptotes have switched, just like the logarithmic and the exponential function. I think that's it. Great, we're done. Uh, go ahead and watch. There's one more video after this about uh, trig and inverse trig and do some practice problems. Good luck with your pre-calc review.